Okay, so yeah, I'm recording guys. Um, let's get started with today's webinar. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, we're going to talk about candlestick analysis. Uh, this is a kind of free day blitz. It's free webinars over the course of three days in which we're going to be discussing price action. I'm going to be splitting my strategy up into three parts. We're going to discuss the three parts of my strategy. First day is today. It's going to be candlestick analysis. Tomorrow, we're going to be looking at support and resistance areas. And uh, the last day, we're going to be looking at actually trading reversals. You know, how to actually trade reversals. It's going to be basically putting candlestick analysis and support resistance areas together. Now, one thing I want to make clear from the start. Today is about candlestick analysis. Candlesticks only. Whenever I do one of these webinars and I say it's only about candlestick analysis, people ask me about support resistance areas nonstop. Um, so please, guys, please, 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 today, only candlestick analysis. Tomorrow, I promise support resistance areas. And we're going to talk a lot about support resistance areas because there have been changes to support resistance areas in the last few months. They are significant changes. They do require more time than, than uh, the old support resistance areas did. They require more time, more management, which kind of sucks because you have to spend more time uh, on your charts. But at the same time, it gives you better trades and more efficient trades. So you're kind of trading up um, extra time spent on support resistance areas for more accurate trades and more trades, which you know is, is usually a pretty decent trade up to be honest. Um, so we are gonna be talking about support resistance areas tomorrow. Yeah, this is going to be recorded. Um, and that's another thing I want to talk about. Everyone asks if these webinars are going to be recorded. So if anyone asks from now on, please just guys who hear this and guys who are here, just say, yes, it will be recorded because I don't want to stop to answer that question uh, 50 times <laughs> in the next hour. <laughs> so just let everyone know it's going to be recorded. We're only going to be talking about candlestick analysis today, guys. So if anyone else asks about support resistance areas or about anything not candlestick analysis related, please remind them guys that this is for candlestick analysis only. Tomorrow is support resistance areas. So all these areas you see drawn on my chart, that's what we're gonna be looking at tomorrow. Uh, so yeah, if you guys could please remind them uh, that that would be that would be fantastic because um, I find that when I stop in my webinars to, to answer questions that have already been answered five or six times, it just slows everything down to a crawl. And I don't get through everything I wanna talk about, so I'm relying on you guys to to tell everyone, uh, to tell everyone about that. Okay, so uh, the other thing is, the other thing I wanna make clear from the start, I suck at webinars. I'm not good at webinars. I'm not a salesman. I'm not, you know, someone who, um, has webinars all prepared and knows exactly what to say and who's only going to give you a little bit of information. You know, I just start these webinars and I just talk. I just talk about Forex, about candlestick analysis today. So yeah, my webinars, they tend not to be very organized, but I'm going to try to give you as much information as I possibly can. And I'm going to try to help out as much as I can. So I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry if the webinar is not as polished as webinars you're used to, but I didn't really try to make my webinars polished. I tried to give you guys good content and a lot of good content. So please excuse me if the webinar is not polished and it's not perfect. Um, you know, uh, please excuse me for that. Um, okay. So, uh, I already said there were some slight changes to my strategy. Um, over the last few months, I've improved my strategy a little bit. I've made some changes, not major changes, but I have made some changes. And sadly, those changes, they require more time spent trading. Not a lot more time, but you know, it used to be, let's say a year ago, where I could do as little as 30 minutes per day and trade successfully. Well, you know, 30 minutes per day, as long as it wasn't a trade. If there was a trade, obviously, it'd be an hour or two to manage a trade. But 30 minutes of looking for trades each day, um, you know, I, I could do that successfully. But these days, my strategy takes a little bit more time. 
Um, not a lot more, but a little bit more time. So I am going to be discussing those changes in depth in the coming days. Um, now, as far as candlestick analysis goes, that hasn't changed. That's never going to change because that's that's a constant. So today's webinar, we're probably going to be talking about a lot of information that if you've been around Forex for Noobs for a while, you already know this stuff. So I am sorry for that, but you got to understand there's a lot of people here who are new and who don't know this stuff. So I am going to be covering a lot of stuff that I've already covered countless times on the website and everywhere else. Um, there is also some new stuff that we're going to be talking about today, but not very much. Um, yeah, we'll keep questions to the end, guys. That's another thing I forgot to say. Um, if people are asking questions throughout the webinar, um, just remind them that questions should be kept to the end. Um, or when I ask for questions, because I will be asking halfway through for questions, etc. Uh, breaking up. Let me quickly do something. All right. Well, if the voice is breaking up for some people, I think it's... I don't think I can fix it. I think it's just going to be an issue that some people are going to suffer. Uh, just give me a quick second. I'm just going to exit some, some programs I have running that might be using up a little bit of my internet connection. I doubt that's the problem, but... Okay. No, UK has very good internet. I'm on 100 megabits per second, so... Uh, I don't know what my upload is. I can't remember. I think it's 20 megabits upload, so it should be fine. I think uh, I'm not sure why people are having problems, but everyone seems to, every, most people seem to have okay audio. Um, if your audio is screwing up, then I guess you're just going to have to cache the recording. Uh, but anyway, let's, let's get started guys. Let's get started. I don't want to spend too much time and uh, we've already spent seven minutes and we haven't actually gone over anything yet. So Candlestick analysis. Um, now, candlestick analysis is basically the... Well, what happened there? Okay, I just had uh, my browser open for some reason. I'm, I'm not sure what that was. Okay, so I was saying candlestick analysis. Now, candlestick analysis is the core part of my trading strategy. It's the it's the first thing I look at every day. I look at the candles and um, basically candlestick analysis is price action. By looking at candles, we're looking at price action and we're reading price action on a chart. We're reading what the price is doing. And whenever I look at candles, I ask myself one question. Um, a lot of you may already know what this question is, but some of you may not. And that question is, who is in control, buyers or sellers? Who's in control of price, buyers or sellers? By asking myself that question and looking at the candles, I get an idea of what the market is going to do in the immediate future. Um, so one setup I look for particularly is an indecision candle, indecision forming on support and resistance. Now indecision, there's a lot of confusion about what indecision is. A lot of people say to me, you know, um, do you look at reversal candles? Now, I don't like that term reversal candles because reversal candles, when someone says that, it kind of insinuates that that candle is going to reverse. Now, I don't like that because a reversal candle, as it's traditionally known, doesn't really suggest the candle is going to reverse. It suggests, or that price is going to reverse, sorry. It suggests that there is potential for price to reverse. Um, but I prefer to call these indecision candles. And I don't really like the whole process that a lot of traders do of splitting these candles up into, um, you know, doji, spinning top, hammer, uh, all kind of... Wait, is everyone else getting audio or is it just Max? All right, cool, cool. Um, so I, I don't really like splitting 
reversal candles or indecision candles up into small uh, little groups, calling them spinning tops, hammers, and all that kind of stuff. I don't feel there's any use for it. When I look at an indecision candle, I just ask myself, who is in control, buyers or sellers? Who's in control, buyers or sellers? And, you know, that is that is the question I ask myself. And when you ask yourself that question, you can pretty clearly tell what price is going to do next. Now, you can't always tell, but it gives you a kind of a general idea of what price is going to do next. Um, so let me show you an example. These are recent trades taken. Um, I didn't take all these trades. I took uh, two today. Um, that worked out quite well, but we're going to look at this trade first. Let me highlight it for you guys. Now, this is a recent trade taken using my strategy. Um, it was a pretty simple trade, but we're going to look at the candles that made up this trade. Um, I'll have to. Sorry, guys, that I have in bad audio. I'm not sure why you guys are having bad audio. But yeah, I'm just going to continue on with the webinar. You you can catch the recording and um, the audio should be fine on the recording. Um, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna look at these uh, recent trades. This one's not a great example, but I'm going to explain to you step by step what's happening here from a price action standpoint and how I look at and read these candles. So. This is, wait, wait, let me get this tool here. This is better. All right, so this is a preceding trend. A preceding trend is just a, a trend. It's just any kind of trend. It can be classed as a preceding trend. But what I call a preceding trend is really a trend that comes before indecision, before I enter a reversal trade. Um, uh, Greg, this is going to be another 50, 49 minutes. And we got about 49 minutes left. So this is a preceding trend. Preceding trend is essentially a, a trend. So in this preceding trend, who's in control of price? So starting here, ending here, who's in control of price? That's a question, by the way, guys. Sellers, 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 bears, sellers, 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 bears. Yeah, exactly. So preceding trend, sellers are in control of price. This is obvious, you know, no one's gonna say buyers are in control of price. Uh, I'm not going to look at preceding trends too much because it's obvious. When you have bearish candles, when you have selling candles, it tells you sellers are in control of price. But what happens when price hits our support area? Now, this is our support area. It was here before price got to here. What happens? We well, are yeah, indecision. Someone said indecision. I'm assuming you know my strategy. So, yeah, um, we get indecision. So we... When, when price hits our support area, the support area that's placed before price actually hits it, we see some indecision. Now, what is indecision? Indecision is quite simple to explain. It's basically a kind of transition of power. We went from a market controlled by sellers, so price was completely controlled by sellers all the way down here. I know with, with the exception of this candle, I guess, that candle was kind of messy. That was indecision too, and so was this. But for the most part, this trend was completely controlled by sellers. Sellers had control of price. Price gets to here, it gets to our support area, and what happens? Well, we start to see indecision. And why is that? Because a support area, and we're going to talk a little bit about support resistance right now, but we're going to cover most of support resistance tomorrow. A support resistance area, or a support area in this case, this is support. A support area is an area full of buyers. So there are buyers grouped down here. We know ahead of time that there are likely buyers grouped in this area. So when we have a sell trend, a trend controlled by sellers, pushing into a support area, an area controlled by buyers, and we see indecision, we see this, that tells us that price is possibly going to reverse here. Now, what specifically is indecision? How do you identify indecision? To do that, you just have to look at the candle and read it. It's really not that hard to do. You just look at the candle and you ask yourself, who's in control of price, buyers, and buyers or sellers? And you ask yourself, what is this candle telling me? What is this specific candle here telling me? This one here. So what is this candle telling me? I'll, I'll tell you what it's telling me. We have this strong lower, uh, this long lower wick. So sellers tried to push price down. You know, they tried to push price down all the way to here, but they couldn't manage it. They just couldn't. They couldn't keep price down. 
buyers pushed price back up. They pushed price back up to here. It closed with a small body, so the sellers didn't really gain any ground. They weren't able to close low, uh, much lower than open. I mean, how much lower is this? This is like 1.6 pips. So sellers managed to close 1.6 pips lower than they open. So this suggests that buyers are fighting back against the sellers. Sellers were in control the whole way down. And then when it got to our support area, an area in which we know there are buyers, buyers started to fight back. And that's how we got this formation. Now, a candle like this, it kind of suggests to us that buyers are going to take control of price and push price up. They're going to take control of price and, and reverse. And this is the you know, classic reversal setup. Now, it's not as simple as it looks. There's more to it, which we're going to discuss in the next three days. But reversal setups, you know, they're, for me anyway, uh, the easiest and most consistent way to make profits in Forex. Um, what is a preceding trend? I'll answer that question real quick. Preceding trend is the trend before the indecision candle. This is the indecision candle. This is the preceding trend. The preceding trend is a bearish trend. Indecision candles suggest buyers are taking control, or at least they're fighting to take control. They're struggling to take control. Um, they're fighting back against the sellers. So, you know, this is a classic reversal setup, and this is the kind of candle I look for. I look for this type of candle. Um, the characteristics of this candle are, are usually the same. Usually I look for a candle like this. I like to have the upper wick being small, now, the upper wick being small is quite important. It's important because that upper wick, if it's too long, let's say it extends to up here, and we're entering a trade, we want to enter our trade after the upper wick is bo broken. This is because when we want to enter this trade, we want, to, we want buyers to prove they have taken control of price. And how do buyers prove they have taken control of price? They make a higher high. They make a high beyond the the high of the previous candle so if the wick extends all the way up to here this high then this is not really a good trade because we're going to have to enter all the way up here and we're entering quite late so when we look at an indecision candle what we want to see usually is a candle with a small lower wick that way we can enter as close to the support area as possible as close as possible we want the candle to have a decent sized lower wick. You know, that lower wick being this big, it kind of indicates to us sellers had a very, very good try at pushing down, but buyers buyers pulled them back up. So that tells us that buyers are quite strong because they were able to, to turn that around. So those are the basic characteristics of an indecision candle. It's a candle that forms on top of a support area, on top of a support area, that has a small upper wick, a long lower wick, and a relatively small body. Now, obviously, in the case of a, of a short trade, that's going to be the opposite, but we'll discuss that in a second. So this is what indecision is. It's basically price comes to a support area, then we start to see indecision, then we can enter a trade based on that indecision. Like I said, there is more to it uh, there is more to it than that, but we will we will be looking at that in more detail in the coming webinars. I know this may be a little bit confusing. You may not know everything, but keep in mind that, you know, we can't really talk about candlesticks without talking about support resistance, without talking about putting them together. So there's some things here that you guys might not fully understand, but be assured that we will be clearing all of that up in the coming webinars in the next few days. But right now, I just want you guys to understand the basics of candlestick analysis. Just what candle, how to read these candles. Because when you look at these candles, and now we're going to look at another example. Um, we're going to look at this. This is actually a trade. Uh, actually, no, we'll stay zoomed out. This is a trade that I actually, uh, I actually took. It was a pretty decent trade. Not a trade I normally take, but it was a, it was a nice trade. Um, I'm going to stop talking for a second and just quickly read what's in chat so I can catch up. Uh, Nick, there is a similar candle at the beginning of the chart on the 6th of November. Why would you ignore that? 
6th of November. Are you referring to this candle? On the 7th of November? This candle? This one. Um, there's no real reason to ignore this one. This was also a potential setup. Um, honestly, this looks like it might've been a failed setup. Depends if it was entered. Yeah, this just looks like it might have been a failed setup. Um, it could have failed because of news or it could have just failed because it was a bad trade. I mean, you know, the strategy is not perfect. There's always going to be bad trades. Um, you're not always going to have winning trades. Uh, this looks like it might have just been possibly a bad trade. I'm not too sure. Um, it could have been news related because it did spike down quite fast. But yeah, I'm not really sure. I can't really remember if that trade was taken. Oh yeah, if this trade was taken, it definitely would have broken the stop loss for sure. Um, the the stop loss is never never that big to allow it to go down this far. So yeah, th this would have uh, this would have been stopped out definitely. Uh, I'm not really going to talk about what the setup would be. We could talk about that in coming days. Like I said, this uh, webinar is about candlestick analysis. And in, in future, in the next two webinars, in the over the next two days, we'll be looking at the setups more and more. Um, I don't want to, I just want to get the basics of candlestick analysis across before we talk about the, the setups. Um, so we'll discuss these, uh, these setups in the coming, in the coming days. Uh... No, it's no problem. Um, okay, so candlestick analysis. Um, I'm, I'm sure you guys understand the basics. Let's look at this next trade. This trade was taken today. All right, so we have the preceding trend. This is the preceding trend. Oops, wrong tool. This is the preceding trend. It's not a fantastic preceding trend, I have to say. Um, it's, not, it's not a great preceding trend, but overall, um, over the course of these one, two, three, four, five candles, it's clear that buyers were in control over the course of these five candles. Then sellers kind of took control towards the end of the week there uh, with this candle on uh, the 21st. And then this was the new weekly candle, the candle that opened on Monday. Now, I... Uh, If I if I pause from if I just stop talking, guys, it's usually because I'm trying to read the chat just to make sure there's no, uh, you know, that people are still hearing me and all that kind of stuff. So if I pause, it's just because I'm reading the chat. Um, is the is the setup equally valid on the four hour chart? Steve is asking. No, there's no setup on the four hour chart here. The setup is only really valid on the eight hour. Sorry, the six hour. Uh, also on the eight hour sort of, but I don't know. I think it looks best on the six hour. So anyway, um, do you mean this candle? Alfredo is saying, Nick, are you going to talk about the bull candle? Uh, about the second candle after the bull candle, the bear candle that looks like indecision. I can talk about that if you want me to, but uh, let's stick to this for a second. I just want to explain uh, kind of the opposite of barrier, uh, a short trade. Um, and I want to take a look at this trade a little bit and then we'll talk about that candle because that is an important question and it is candlestick analysis related. So we'll look at that in a sec. Uh, okay, so... Um, with this, with this setup, it was it's quite clear that this is the preceding trend. Um, we do have on Friday price dropped down a bit, but then it gapped up on Monday and it opened up up here on, well, on Sunday technically. So th this is still a an okay setup. 
Um, I tend to be very cautious about trading, uh, taking trades that are split up by a weekend. You know, if uh, this formed on Friday, like it did, wait, let me highlight the, the Friday part. Um, well, the part from last week. This form last week and then this here, this other part is the start of the new week. So I tend to be very cautious about taking those trades, but I've been taking them more and more recently just to test them out and they, they work quite well, even if they're split by a, a weekend. Uh, John, you have to switch back. Uh, John is asking if he has to switch back between timeframes, back and forth. Um, yeah, it, it is best to switch back and forth between timeframes because it gives you a better idea of uh, what price is doing. Um, and I'll explain that in a second too. So um, this was this was quite an obvious setup. Basically, we had the preceding trend. So we have buyers in control of price. Buyers are in complete control of price. They hit our resistance area. Now, this resistance area existed before uh, this indecision formed. So price hit our resistance area. It ran into resistance, an area in which we know there are sellers. We know there are sellers in resistance. And what happens? Well, on Friday, as soon as it hit this resistance area, it created this huge upper wick, and then price started dropping. Then Monday, price gaps up. So it gaps up a little bit, but we get indecision. And we get what can be called an almost perfect indecision candle. Now, what constitutes a perfect indecision candle? And this is what I wanted to concentrate on for most of today. Um, uh, that's a good question. I'll just uh, answer that real quick. How many candles do you consider a, a strong or weak preceding trend? A preceding trend can be made up of as little as one candle. A single candle preceding trend is um, often leads to a very good setup, actually. So preceding trends don't need a lot of candles. They could be a single candle. But if it's a single candle, it needs to be a single large candle. Uh, the general rule I have is you look at the two support resistance areas. So these are two support resistance areas here. So this is just a general rule, just to give you a general idea of um, how large your preceding trend should be. Your preceding trend should be at least 75% of the way between these two areas. So the space between these two areas is here. So yeah, that's the space between two areas. Your preceding trend should be no less than 75% of the way. So. I don't know. I'm just going to, I'm not going to calculate it exactly, but let's say this is 25%. So this space here is around about 75%. So if your preceding trend starts here and moves up, that's fine, even if it's a single candle. But if your preceding trend were to start here, for example, like halfway between, then that would be a weak preceding trend. So a preceding trend strength isn't, uh, I don't judge it by the amount of candles. I judge it by where it started. Uh, zero, you're saying at one point I said 50%. Um, yeah, like I said, there have been some changes to my strategy uh, over the, the last few months to adapt with changing market conditions. But anyway, uh, that question is answered. So let's keep looking at, at this setup here. Um, and that's, the, no, okay. Um, one second guys, my drawing tools are bugging out and I can't, all right, that's better, that's better, okay. Is it working? Yeah, it's working. Awesome. Okay, so uh, this is the preceding trend. Buyers taking control of price. This is the indecision here. Now, this indecision candle, it indicates buyers and sellers are kind of fighting for control of price. So we went from a market controlled by buyers. Buyers were in control of price, with the exception of this candle, of course. Um, then open next week, and then we get this struggle between buyers and sellers. So on Sunday, buyers tried to push up. They got pulled back down. Sellers tried to push down, they got pulled back up. Now, this is an almost perfect indecision candle. It's not almost perfect because of the body. Um, it, it's almost perfect because of its placement. Uh, 
Uh, how do I define a trend? We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So it's perfect because of its placement. So this candle is placed, it formed right on top of the support resistance area. So it formed right here, right on top of the support resistance area, right in the center of it. Now, that usually gives us the perfect placement. Why is that? Because it allows us to get into this trade very, very close to the top of this uh, this uh, resistance area. Now, in a, a resistance area is an area full of sellers. Um, so an area full of sellers, when price, when you sell, you're basically selling with the sellers. You're selling with the sellers and sellers are strongest at the resistance area. They're strongest here at our resistance area. That's where they are the strongest. So if you were to enter down here, for example, sellers would already be getting weaker by the time they reach this point, and they might not have the strength to continue all the way down. But entering up here, it ensures you're entering at the point where sellers are the strongest. That's why when you're looking for indecision to form on your support resistance areas, you don't want indecision to form too low. You don't want it to form too high. You want it to form right in the center of your support resistance area. That is generally the strongest the strongest indecision candle when it forms right in the center because it allows you to enter in a good spot. It allows you to enter where sellers are the strongest. You don't want to enter where sellers are weak. You want to enter where sellers are strong. You want to sell with the sellers when they're strong. So entering up here, entering at this, uh, uh, entering this high is, is ideal. And um, that's part of the reason why I entered this trade today because I was entering all the way up. I was entering when sellers were in control of price. Um, so that, that is something to consider with, uh, with candlestick analysis. It's not only about reading the candle. It's not only about understanding what this candle is telling you, because this candle is clearly telling you there's indecision. It's clearly telling you that we're not sure who's in control of price. When we see this candle price could continue up or it could push down. We're not hundred percent sure. All this candle is telling us is that price is undecided. We went from a candle like this one that clearly indicated buyers were in control to a candle that indicated we're undecided, who's in control. The market hasn't, hasn't been able to decide. So when you get that candle, um, when you look at this candle, you know it's an indecision candle. But there's more to it than that. It's not only about reading the candles. When you're looking at this indecision candle as an actual trade setup, you need it to form in the right spot because when it forms in the right spot, it gives you the best entry. It gives you the best chance to enter at the right spot. And this is where you want your candles to form. You want them to form on top of your support resistance areas because that gives you the best entry. You're entering when sellers are at their strongest. Um, do I wait for candles to finish before I enter the trade? Of course I do, yeah. Candle has to finish before you enter the trade. An indecision candle is not an indecision candle until it closes. Um, if it doesn't close, then it could have just been an indecision candle temporarily. And then right towards uh, the end of the candle, it pushes up and buyers take control of price. So you can't enter too early. You have to wait for the candle to close. You have to wait for the next candle to open. But we'll discuss more about entries in, uh, in the, next, uh, the next few webinars. I just want to discuss the basics of, uh, of um, candlestick analysis. I just want you guys to understand what I look at and how I think about candles because a lot of people, they look at a chart and they just see candles as some basic information of what price is doing right now. But that's not what candles are. Candles give you a lot of information. They tell you who is in control of price. And that is the most important question you can ask yourself when trading. Who is in control of price? Because when you know who is in control of price, you know what direction you should be trading. If you have no clue who's in control of price, you could be entering in the wrong direction. But if you know with 100% certainty that sellers are in control of price and you short, you go short at the right time, then your, your, your trade has a huge chance of working out. It could still fail, of course, but it has a much greater chance of working out because you know who is in control of price and you're shorting at the best possible point. You're shorting with sellers at the best possible point. So today, I just want you guys to understand the basics of candles, and then tomorrow we'll look at support resistance and all that other stuff. Uh, I'm just going to read the, the chat real quick.
Uh, Lornette, uh, yeah, there's ways to filter out potential bad trades, but we'll talk about that in the coming days. Um, all these webinars are going to be recorded, so if you can't attend tomorrow's webinar or the next day's, don't worry, it will be recorded and it will be uploaded. Uh, anyway, so let's continue. Uh, I'm going to look at a few other trades and then I'm going to come back to this candle here um, because someone mentioned this candle and it's quite important to discuss this, so we'll discuss that soon. But um, I just want to look at uh, this setup here. This is another trade from today. Not exactly the best setup, but... Again, it was a, it was a good setup, and right now uh, this setup is stalling, and it's potentially going to form another setup. So that's why I particularly wanted wanted to look at that. Okay, so this is another trade from today. Um, like I said, I know I don't normally trade uh, can uh, setups that are broken up by by the weekend, but I don't know this week. I just I just went for it. Um, now this one isn't as nice. And if we look at the four hour, it's not very clear on the four hour. Um, it looks okay on the eight hour. Um, it looks pretty decent on the eight hour. Uh, I traded it on the six hour and eight hour charts. Uh, and that's another thing I should say. I realize um, uh, wait, I'm, I'm just reading guys. That's why I've gone silent. Yeah, uh, we're gonna we're gonna look at at, uh, at that in a second. Um, anyway, so th this setup was not as good. This indecision candle was not as good. But I just want to explain. I just want to show you guys a setup that doesn't look as good because you know it, it's all easy for me to show you the perfect trade setup and to say, oh, I I took this trade, I took this trade, and it's perfect. But when you actually go out there and use my strategy on the chart. You're not always going to run into those perfect trades. You know, a lot of the times you're going to get trades that you're not too sure about. The indecision doesn't look perfect or there's something wrong with it. And especially with those trades, you kind of have to be prepared and and kind of you have to be able to read candles effectively to understand what's going on there and to actually to enter the trades. So um, I, was, I want to look at this trade. And if we have time, we'll quickly switch to USD CAD and look at this. Uh, so yeah, this trade from today. All right, eight hour chart. Now this is a strong proceeding trend. This is a single candle proceeding trend. I guess you could also consider this part of the proceeding trend if you want and say it's a free candle proceeding trend. But for the most part, um, I, I was only really looking at this candle for the proceeding trend. That is a strong proceed proceeding trend. No one can doubt that sellers were in complete control of price for this candle. But when this candle got down to here, to this support area, an area in which we know there are buyers, we do see this lower wick here. So we do quite clearly see that um, buyers are fighting for control of uh, for fighting for control of price. And this candle couldn't really close much lower than the support area. Well, it didn't close lower at all, to be honest. Um, then next week, uh, sorry, not the next week. Then at the end of that week, we could see price pushed up. Here, so you know this quickly tells us that our support area was accurate. You know our support area here; it's accurate. It tells us that sellers are in control of price. When price approaches this area, sellers take control of price. This is what this told us. Then, in the following week, uh, today or Sunday, this candle opens. Now, this candle opens right here on the support area, and this candle starts to to look like indecision. I mean, it's not the perfect indecision candle, not by any means, but it is a, a decent indecision candle. It looks a little better on this chart here. You know, we got a lower wick. We've got a bullish body. So when you read this candle, what does it tell you? You just look at it and you can quickly understand what's going on here. Price has approached an area in which we know there are, there are buyers. So sellers ran into an area of buyers. And what are buyers doing? They're now fighting for control of price. We got that lower wick indicates sellers tried to push down, but they couldn't manage to, to push down for very long. Buyers closed higher than they opened. So that indicates buyers to control the price. They pushed up a little bit. So, you know, this is an indecision candle. It indicates indecision, indicates buyers uh, are fighting for control of price. Now, again, this trade's upper wick is not of that long. 
I mean, it is a little above uh, the, the support area. So that makes the entry a little riskier because you, you're entering up here. So it, it makes the entry a little bit riskier because you want to enter when price breaks the high of the previous candle because that tells us that buyers have taken control of price. Um, so this is somewhat risky. But, you know, this is why I wanted to show you this setup because this setup was not as perfect as the other setups. So I, I don't want to show you only setups that were perfect. But even though this is not perfect, it's still a good trade. It's still, uh, it still had a lot of potential and it was a successful trade. You know, even if you enter up here at the high of the indecision candle, you can keep quite a tight stop of around about 40 pips. And your first target can be somewhere around 40 pips or it could even be up here at 75 pips. Um, we'll, we'll talk more about this trade uh, tomorrow and the next day. Um, but the, the most important thing is when you're looking at your charts, you know, when you're looking at your charts, you have to ask yourself at all times who is in control of price. That is the most important question you can ever ask yourself when you're looking at charts. Who is in control of price? If you ask yourself that question this whole way down, right? You're looking at, oh, wait, let's go back to the eight hour. It's uh, a bit simpler. Um, uh, one sec, I'm just quickly reading the chat. All right, cool. So yeah, we, we look at, we're looking at this and we're asking ourselves who's in control of price. I'm just gonna give you an example um, of what this question means and how I ask it to myself. So I see this candle. I say, who's in control of price? Well, with this candle, sellers are overall in control, but it's quite clearly a little bit indecision. We're not, buyers and sellers are still struggling a little bit. Then we look at this candle. I ask myself, who's in control of price? I say sellers, they have a pretty firm control of price. They've made a lower low. So sellers were able to close lower, or sorry, to push lower than the previous candle. Um, buyers weren't able to push higher than the previous candle. In fact, buyers were only able to push up one pip from the open of the candle before sellers took control of price. So I asked myself, who's in control of price? Clearly sellers. I look at this candle here, this huge red candle here, and I say to myself, who's in control of price? Who is in control of price? That's, that's very, very obvious with this candle. It's quite clear sellers are in control of price. Then I look at this candle and I say, who's in control of price? Buyers are in control of price. Buyers hit our support area and they took control of price. Then I look at this candle in the following week and I say, who's in control of price? And the answer to that question this time is, it's not completely decided, but it looks like buyers have more control of price, but sellers are clearly trying to take control of price. We're kind of seeing a struggle between buyers and sellers with this candle, but overall buyers are winning that struggle. Then this candle here, you say who's in control of price, quite clearly buyers. But by this point, the trade's entered. And when you're in a long trade and you ask yourself who's in control of price, you better hope the answer is buyers because you know, you've know you entered long, you want buyers to be in control. If the answer is sellers, then you probably shouldn't be in that trade, to be honest. Um, so asking yourself who's in control of prices is, is a very important process in your trading. Even if you're not trading my strategy, even if you're trading you know, some indicator-based strategy, you have to remember to ask yourself who's in control of price and to learn to read the candles because candles give you so much insight into what's going on in your chart and what's going on with price, with the price of that pair. And just asking yourself who's in control of price, it trains your mind to read the candles because when you ask yourself that question, you're forcing yourself to look at this candle and to analyze it and to understand what that candle is telling you. It's, it's vital that you ask yourself this question. Um, and if you were to ask it over in this trade, it, you can kind of, uh, this was the candle. Yeah, this was the candle someone asked about. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at this candle now and I'm going to go through the process of asking myself who's in control of price just to kind of explain what this candle means and if this candle would affect me entering this, this short trade up here in any way, shape or form. Uh, so uh, we look at this candle, right? 
who's in control of price? Obviously buyers. There's pretty much no doubt that buyers in control of price. Then we look at this candle. Now this candle, when we see it, we ask ourselves, who's in control of price? And the answer is clearly that this is indecision. We're not sure who's in control of price. Buyers and sellers are struggling for control of price. It has a bearish body, so obviously sellers are winning that struggle. But that's not important. Overall, this is not important that sellers have uh, struggled with uh, buyers at this point. I mean, yeah, it is a little bit annoying because you're in a long trade. But overall, this candle is still pretty decent. Now, I know that sounds weird. I know it does, but it's still pretty decent. And why is it decent? Because when you're, when you're looking at this candle, and it is clear that buyers and sellers are struggling here, and even though it's closed with that body, you know, that bearish body, even though it's closed like that, there's still a reason to believe that buyers have overall control of price. Because it made a higher high. Buyers were able to push beyond the high of the previous candle. Sellers were not able to create a lower low. Sellers were not able to push lower. So even though this has a bearish body and it does show there is a struggle between buyers and sellers, it's no reason to jump out of your trade. Buyers were able to push higher and they were able to maintain. They were able to prevent sellers from pushing lower than the previous candle. So buyers are still overall in control of price with this candle. Uh, Steve? Yeah, you could definitely... Uh, Steve's asking, could this be classed as, as a struggle between buyers and sellers? It definitely is. It is a struggle between buyers and sellers. Ideally, this is not what you want to see when you're in a trade. So this was a long trade, right? Um, this was a long trade. We had the preceding trend here. Then we had indecision. Then buyers and, uh, you know, people entered and you entered long with the buyers, but then you get that, that candle there. That is not what you want to see when you're in a trade. You don't want to see that candle. But at the same time, it's not a reason to enter into panic mode and to jump out of your trade because all signs are telling us that buyers have not lost control of price. So when you're asking yourself who's in control of price, you've just entered a long trade. You've entered long here. With the first candle, you say to yourself, who's in control of price? Buyers. Good, because I'm in a long trade. I want buyers to be in control. With this candle, you ask yourself, who's in control of price? The answer is price is struggling. Buyers and sellers are fighting for control. It kind of sucks. I'm in a long trade. Buyers and sellers are struggling. I'd prefer that buyers are in complete control. But overall, we've still got a higher high. We've still got a higher low. So we're still doing good. You know, then you look at this next candle here. Who's in control of price? Buyers are in control of price. They've made a higher high. They made a higher low. And the, the candle closed further up uh, than the open. So that is a good sign. You see this candle. Who's in control of price? You ask yourself again. Now, this one is kind of bad. This one kind of sucks. And to be fair, with this one, you would have already closed out part of your position up here. So you would have already closed out part of your position. Your stop loss would have been moved to your entry. So this candle might have actually stopped you out. Depends on how tight your stop loss is, you know. Depends how tight your stop loss is. This candle may have stopped you out from this trade. But you still would have made profit overall because you've closed out half of your trade or three quarters of your trade up here with profit, move your stop loss to the entry price, and you would have made zero on half of your trade or one quarter of your trade, and you would have made, let's look at the numbers, 45 pips or so, well, maybe, maybe a bit less. Um, that's a bit optimistic that you got out right at the top. But, you know, you would have made about 40 pips on three quarters of your trade or half of your trade. So, you know, it's not the best trade, but it's still profit in the end. It's still a profitable trade. And um, not everyone uh, got stopped out uh, when price came back down. Some people have, you know, a bit of a looser stop and they were able to ride it all the way up. It just depends on how you, you choose to manage your trades. Money management is something that in the end is, is kind of up to you how you choose to manage your trades. Uh, Saul, I'm going to answer your question. Mm 
No, 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 no. People need to stop typing. Please. When everyone types, it keeps uh, dragging down the chat. So can you paste your question back in? I, I can't see it. I can't see it uh, anymore. Uh, I have the same question as Costa's Greece. Uh, why the bull indecision candle up in the first support resistance area, 17 November, does not make a good signal for you? Um, I never said it doesn't make a good signal. This one here? Yeah, I never said it doesn't make a good signal. It doesn't, but I'm, I'm just saying I, I never said it doesn't make a good, a good setup. Um, uh, but yeah, it doesn't. And uh, nor does this one. It's kind of the same trade. I'm not sure which one to look at. This one would be a better example to look at. No, it has nothing to do with it being on a resistance area. We could take trades from resistance. Um, but I was going to talk about... Uh, I was going to talk about this one here. This one here. But it's pretty much the same as this one here. So we'll just look at this one because this one looks more like a decent trade setup, but it wasn't. So we'll, we'll check this one out. Um, okay, so this is something you need to learn about candlestick analysis. And it's that higher highs and higher lows, lower lows and lower highs are, are important. Candles, when you look at them, you're looking for you're looking for higher highs and higher lows. That is the most important thing. And this is where we're going to define trends. I know you've been asking about that, Max. So we'll we'll look at that right now. So higher highs and higher lows are, are vital because if you look at a trade, right? Um, or if you look at, at a preceding trend, let's say, and it's a bullish preceding trend, it's in a buyer's nature. It's in the bull's nature to create higher highs and higher lows. That is what bulls are striving to do. You know, bulls are striving to create higher highs and higher lows. Because when a bull creates a higher high and a higher low, it's creating a bullish trend. So what is a higher high and a higher low? For those who don't know, um, price opens here and it closes higher than it opened. And it doesn't push down any lower than the previous candle. Then the next candle does the same. It doesn't push down any lower than the previous candle, closes higher than it opened. So this is a higher high and this is a higher low because this low is higher than the previous low, hence higher low. So it's in a buyer's nature to create a higher, higher highs and higher lows. So that is what a preceding trend is. As long as you've got those higher highs and higher lows and most of those, most of the trend is comprised of higher highs and higher lows, and as long as they're moving in a pretty consistent direction, there can be some disruptions in the trend. Most trends aren't perfect, but as long as buyers are moving higher highs, higher lows, and sellers, if it's a bearish trend, are doing lower lows and lower highs, as long as that's happening, that is what a preceding trend is. You know, you're looking at higher highs, higher lows, lower lows, lower highs. Uh, yeah, lower lows, lower highs. That's what defines a, a good preceding trend. And... You know, looking back at, where was it? This, this example, um, this is a, a good preceding trend. It's not a perfect preceding trend. Like I said from the start, not a perfect preceding trend. But overall, most of these candles here, they're showing us higher highs and higher lows. This candle, higher, 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 low. This candle, higher, high, higher, low. This candle, same. This candle, no. But then that candle, same. Higher, high, higher, low. So most of the candles in this preceding trend, they are doing higher highs, higher lows. Therefore, it is a preceding trend. Does everyone, uh, does everyone get that? Do you have any questions about trends? Yeah, that question's already been asked. A single candle preceding trend is fine. There's no problem with a single candle preceding trend. I actually think we just looked at one here. This was a trade. This was a single candle preceding trend here. I mean, yeah, you could count those two candles, but um, 
I mostly look at the two support resistance areas, so this one and this one. And this preceding trend formed above this, uh, this area and it closed here. So that is a single candle preceding trend, that's fine. Um, but anyway, let's, let's uh, keep going. I wanna look at this candle specifically because this candle is kind of important. Um, a lot of people who don't uh, trade reversals, they'll look at this candle and they'll say, ooh, that looks like a good setup. I wanna enter short there. But you can't really take a trade like this one. Let's see what it looks like on four hour. Yeah, okay. Uh, we'll stick to the eight hour chart. It looks best on here. No, Saul, as we were just saying, a single candle preceding trend is fine. Uh, Phil, we'll probably discuss that on on uh, Wednesday's webinar, the final webinar in this series. We'll discuss more about the analysis side of things. Um, but yeah, right now we're going to look at this candle. Um, please, no more questions until we do this because I really want to get through this. All right, so this candle, what does this candle tell us? That is a question to you guys. What does this candle tell us? You know, we have this very strong preceding trend, nice, strong, bullish preceding trend here. Let me, yeah, here. And then we get this candle. What does this candle tell us? Yep, indecision, indecision, indecision. Everyone's got it right. It tells us there's indecision, which is fine. I mean, when you see that, we know what's probably going to happen next. When you see this, we know that sellers are probably going to take control of price and that, that price is going to turn around and come down. Now, we know that, but the problem is that we can't take this trade. And it sucks, you know. Sometimes you see a trade like this and you don't take it. It sucks. I would have wanted to enter this trade, but the indecision candle, it just didn't give us an opportunity to enter. Now, that's because of higher highs and higher lows. This candle closed right on top of the support area, but that lower wick, look at that wick. It's just way too big. When I, If I were to enter this trade, I'd have to enter at the low of this wick because my, one of my entry criteria is I want to enter when sellers prove they've taken control of price because I'm asking myself, who's in control of price? So I see this candle, then I look at this candle here and I say, who's in control of price? And my answer is sellers are not in control of price until they push and make a lower low. I want sellers to make a lower low before they prove to me that they have taken control of price. So I would have to enter this trade all the way down here. And entering that trade all the way down there, way, 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 way too risky because you enter there and you're so far away from this resistance area. So this is the resistance area. This is the area full of sellers. We know there are sellers up here. But if you enter all the way down here, sellers are losing strength already. You don't know if they'll have the strength to push all the way down to here like they did. Um, you know, they might do. They might not do. We don't know. Um, so a trade like this is not is not good. You want your indecision candles to be smaller than this. You want the lower wick of the indecision candle to be very small. You want it to be up inside the support area, uh, the resistance area in this case, sorry. If possible, you want it to be up inside the resistance area because if it's inside the resistance area, you're getting in short when sellers are at their strongest, which is up here. That's where sellers are their strongest. Uh, wait, and we'll go back to this candle um, real quickly. This candle is the same thing. You know, we know what's likely going to happen here, but that indecision, that that wick is just so low. We, we can't really take that trade. It's just not a viable setup. We can't take it. Um, so someone was asking about this here. Not a viable setup. It sucks. Sometimes you have to give up trades that you know, you know that it's going to reverse because you're asking yourself that question you're asking yourself who's in control of price, buyers or sellers, and you know that this is indecision. And you know when this candle forms and it breaks that low, you know sellers are in control of price and that it's very likely going to keep pushing down. But, you know, just because you know what's likely to happen, it doesn't mean you should be in the trade. Because sometimes entering a trade is just too risky and a smart trader knows when it's too risky and when not to take the trade.
So you can jump into these kind of trades, but overall, it's gonna it's gonna lead to problems because by the time sellers get down to here, they're already weak. The the further sellers get away from a resistance area, the weaker they get. And by the time sellers get down to here, they've already started getting weak. And we could see that they started getting weak because we see all that stuff there. See, that tells us sellers are weak. Buyers are fighting for control of price. Yeah, it did continue down eventually and it got all the way down to here, but it was just way too risky. It shouldn't be entered. And I actually wanted to look at USD CAD because I had a very similar thing on USD CAD today. Um, this trade could have been successful. It could have been successful. Looked like a nice setup, but it just, I, I didn't enter because it just formed way too far above the support area. So this is my support area here. I want my indecision to form on top of my support area. I want it to form down here because if I'm entering up here, then the, the risk reward ratio is not going to be good. I'm entering too high. I'm entering too far from the support area. Now, again, this is an example of, yes, this did work out. This trade definitely worked out. It would have been a decent trade, um, but I stayed out of it. Now, you may be thinking, well, you missed a good opportunity, but the truth is I didn't. Well, I guess I did technically, but if I were to take trades like this all the time, I would fail. Um, here's just an example here. This is just a random example I see right now. Here. So price came down, very strong proceeding trend, very good proceeding trend. Indecision forms here. Now, a lot of people will say, Ooh, indecision form there. You've got support up here, Nick. So that, that's close enough, that support area. Um, I could enter at the top of this indecision candle and that would be a good trade. But no, it wouldn't be a good trade because price has formed way too far below the support area. This support area is there for a reason. Now, what you're doing with this, it's the opposite to it forming above. It's forming below. But the problem here is this is a support area. But when support is broken, it becomes resistance. So after price broke down here and this candle formed here, this now became a resistance area. Now this is an area with sellers. Sellers are going to take control of price when, when price pushes up to here and they're going to push down. So what you're doing here, if you enter at this point, you're buying into a group of sellers. And as you see, this would not have worked out. So you want your indecision to form on top of the support area um, or the resistance area like here. Here it formed on top of the resistance area and it was a good trade, but here it formed below and it wasn't. There are going to be times where you have to skip a trade, even though you likely know what's going to happen next, but it is smarter to skip that trade. If your indecision does not form on top of your support area, then you may as well skip the trade. Uh, Aaron, say you entered this trade anyway, how do you tell it would go through? Um, you can't really tell it would go through. I mean, it is, it's a resistance area. So, you know, there are sellers grouped up here. I know it did push through a bit, but it didn't, it didn't manage to maintain its push through this area. The next time this happened here, again, it pushed up to here, but then it, it came back down for a bit before continuing up. This is a resistance area. Resistance and support, support and resistance, it just means when price gets to those areas, things are gonna get messy because you're, not, you're no longer gonna have that nice consistent move of buyers and sellers. Price is probably gonna get messy. Buyers and sellers are gonna start struggling and price is gonna get messy. And when you enter a trade and you ask yourself who's in control of price, if you enter a short trade, you want that answer to be sellers. You enter a short trade, you want that answer to be sellers are in control of price. And if you enter long here and you ask yourself who's in control of price, you are going to say buyers for this first candle, but buyers have to get through quite a big obstacle to maintain control of price. And they're not always going to get through that obstacle. That obstacle in this case is a whole group of sellers in this area. So you need to ask yourself who's in control of price and you also need to think about what obstacles price is going to face when you're in a trade. That's why you don't want to enter below support or resistance or above it. You want to enter when your indecision forms on top of support resistance. 
yeah, in this case, definitely today, had I taken this trade, I would have made profit. But there are a lot of times where something forms like this and it's not going to be profitable. So taking the risk is just not worth it in the long run. Alfredo, I don't have time to talk about the little changes in my strategy, but the little changes are mostly to do with support resistance areas, and tomorrow's webinar is completely dedicated to support resistance areas. So yeah, we'll discuss it in tomorrow's webinar, definitely. We'll discuss the changes in, in detail. Um, I, I just wanted to do candlestick analysis today, because this three-day blitz, you know, we're going to split it up into candlesticks, support resistance, and then putting those two together. Um... And yeah, today is just candlestick analysis. I know I did talk a little about support resistance, but there's no way I can discuss candlestick analysis without discussing a bit of support resistance. But tomorrow we'll be looking at support resistance in a lot more detail. Anya, how many trades do I take per month? Uh, it really depends. Uh, this month I've been extremely busy and I only took about two trades. But that's not really normal for me. I don't take so few trades. Um, but generally speaking, in November and December, things start to quieten down and I get a little busy and I tend to trade a lot less. Um, I would say on average, uh, about eight trades per month. That would be the average. Andrea, can I switch to EuroJPY? Uh, not GBPJPY. I'll tell you why I can't do GPJPY real quick. GPJPY, bam. Go to the monthly chart. We'll throw a line up here. I don't have any support resistance for GPJPY. Uh, and eight. You have to go all the way back to 2008 to find support resistance for GPJPY. And even then, it had only crossed through for a very brief period. Before that, you have to go back to 2003 before you have any consistent moves through this area. So it's almost impossible to place support resistance on GPJPY at the moment. Thus, I am not trading it. EuroJPY, it's a bit easier because we can actually... Um, price has moved through the areas recently, so we have a better idea, but... We're on a similar kind of thing with EuroJPY. It was 2003, it moved through briefly, but it did stay here a little bit longer. Um, then we have 2006. It's hard to play support resistance areas on these pairs at the moment. Uh, so I'm not trading them as actively as I once used to. Yeah, what's your question about it though, specifically about... Oh yeah, four hour charts are fine. Four hour, six hour, eight hour, 12 hour and daily charts are what I trade. You mean this trade? Compared to eight hour charts, is the four hour chart profitable? I would say eight hour charts are more profitable, but four hour is also profitable. Um, so Andrea is asking, when you know that tonight G JPY banks will publish some news, do you put a short entry? Um, well, th there's no trade here at the moment. I mean, yeah, the, there's no trade set up. I mean, it, this could form into indecision, this candle here. It could definitely form into indecision. But as it stands, it's not indecision yet. Yeah, I, I realize that, but still, there's no indecision here. I mean, this candle is somewhat undecided, but the indecision, it hasn't closed yet. You don't get indecision until a candle closes.
imagine it's a pin bar like you have with uh, with your broker. Wait, let me see what the news actually is. I don't want to. Uh, I want to see what the news is before I actually say if I would trade through that news. All right, what do we have? Uh, BOJ governor speaks. And that is happening in around about five hours. Yeah, I'd probably not take this trade. I'd probably not take it because speeches are kind of like, speeches just suck. Speeches are so unpredictable. When you have like a news release that's just numbers, you know, there's usually predictions as to what those numbers are going to are going to be. But speeches, they're just so unpredictable. If someone says the wrong thing, or someone says the right thing but it's interpreted in the wrong way, it can cause crazy movements in price. So when it comes to speeches, I tend to stay out of the market usually. Uh, someone's asking, can there be an indecision candle and the market still moves in the in the same direction? Yeah, of course. I, in, indecision is just that. It's just indecision. Indecision does not mean reversal. Indecision means price is undecided, but price could decide. So this candle here, let's say this is indecision. It's already closed. Price could decide that it's going to keep moving in that direction, or it could decide that it's going to reverse. Indecision does not mean reversal. Uh, won't news get you out of good trades? Yeah, it can do, but it just depends. You just got to know which news to trade and which news not to trade. Uh, I just tend not to trade through speeches because I'm afraid that whoever's giving the speech is going to say something that's going to cause the price to move like crazy. And I've been hurt by speeches in the past way too much, um, especially when Bernanke was around. That guy just like destroyed my trades so many times because he can't keep his mouth shut. Um, I just, I don't trust speeches. It's just one of those things that, yeah, sometimes I have to skip good trades because, because of speeches, but to me, it's just not worth it. Uh, Evo, please give us some examples of candles that would, that would make you exit open positions. Oh man, that is a vast subject and it'll take a long time to go through it all and we sadly do not have the time. We're already about 15 minutes over and I don't want to spend another 45 minutes discussing that, but I could do a blog post on that. We could discuss it more on the blog um, or just like as an additional video or something. What is your average trade length? Do you do day long trades? Sure, yeah, sometimes I hold my trades for a few days. Sometimes, uh, I, I honestly, I don't know what the average is, man. I, I don't, I don't keep records to that extent where I like time the trade and then figure out an average. I, maybe I should, maybe it'd be interesting to have that data, but I, I, so I don't, I don't keep that kind of data. After weekends, there are sometimes very huge gaps. You seem to ignore candles starting after a big gap. Um, I'm not sure what you mean I ignore them. How, how do I ignore them? Is your USD better to trade than Euro JPY? I would say kind of yes at the moment. Just because Euro JPY is, like I showed you, venturing into territory that we haven't seen in a long time. Um, it makes Euro JPY a bit harder to trade. See, it's at this high here, and this it was last at that area in 2008, and before that it was 2006. So it, it's hard to get good support resistance areas for EURJPY currently, which makes it slightly more difficult to trade. But generally speaking, I wouldn't say EURJPY is more difficult than EURUSD. 
No pair is more difficult than another pair. I mean, there are periods in which AUD USD is the absolute best pair to trade, and you can't take a trade wrong on AUD USD. But then there are periods like now where AUD USD is just really messy, and it's a lot harder to get nice trades on there. I mean, yeah, there was a trade here and there was a trade there, but if you look at this period here, this pair was extremely messy, and it's almost impossible to take a nice trade there. Even through here, it's hard to see a good trade here. So there is no best pair to trade. It just changes. Uh, all pairs have their cycles, and they, they change. Uh, the candles change. Uh, the best pair is something that you know changes on a month-by-month -month basis. New Zealand is very messy. Yeah, New Zealand, sometimes uh, USD New Zealand sorry, New Zealand USD, I meant, is a fantastic bear. Uh, sometimes it, it, it sucks. It's just, it depends, guys. Um, if a trade is only good on one time frame, do you ignore all other time frames? We'll discuss that on Wednesday's webinar, the third webinar. Uh, indecision starts after a gap. Often there is a small reversal closing the gap only to only bounce back again, hitting your stop loss. Uh, do, do you have a specific example? Like, if you show me a specific example, it, it, it'd help. Like a time and date that I could look at. But, you know, zero... How about we do this? I assume you're going to be at the next webinar. If you can't make time for the next webinar, or the Wednesday Wednesday's webinar, sorry. If you can't make time for Wednesday's webinar, you can Skype me or email me with the specific setup you're looking at, um, and we'll discuss it there. Because on Wednesday's webinar, we're going to be discussing trades, like actual trades, the entries, and all that kind of stuff. So it would probably, that question will probably be best answered on Wednesday, and, you know, if you have a specific setup you want to show me on Wednesday, we'll take a look at it, you know? Yeah, Um. if you're not going to be here Wednesday, just send me the setup via Skype or via email. And that way I'll, I'll write it down and we'll take a look at it. Uh, thanks, Nick. By the way, is the advanced course will be opening soon? I'm not sure when the advanced course is going to open. Um, I... I'm really busy right now, and I don't really like to take on new members into the advanced course when I'm busy because I feel like I can't provide the time to them that, that they deserve. And with with how busy I am, I just I don't really think I can take advanced course members right now. Do I never react to engulfing patterns? No, not really. Not a big fan of engulfing patterns. Do you think you'll find a couple of minutes to update your SR? Mm. See, the problem is that I updated them today. So, yeah, I found some minutes. Finally, it's been a long time. I agree with you. I'm going to update my support resistance on a weekly basis now, though, um, because of the changes to support resistance areas. Uh, here is a link to the current support resistance areas. There you go. And yeah, they've been updated, so enjoy. I'll probably be adding more to that list too, so yeah. Anyway, guys, we're 20 minutes over schedule, um, and I have not had my dinner yet, so I am starving. And my girlfriend's probably very annoyed at me because I said to her the webinar's going to finish at 8 o'clock, and now it's 8.20. So I am going to end this webinar. Um, I'm going to go have some dinner. Tomorrow, we're going to be starting at the same time, and we're going to be talking about support resistance areas, which is, I guess, pretty much the most important thing in my strategy. Um, because without the support resistance areas, you're kind of, you, you don't know what to do. So we'll be discussing support resistance areas tomorrow. So thanks for attending, guys. I hope you found this useful.